So today with me I've got Brendan Lee on the line. I'm going to talk to him about the making of his latest film, uh, Catalonia Story. Uh, if you don't know who Brendan Lee is, he's a really talented filmmaker uh, who does all kinds of really cool videos, but I think he, I would almost say he specializes in these kind of travel films that are very unique and original. His previous film called Seoul Wave uh, kind of took the internet by storm and it was definitely just a unique film in the way that it was not not just shot but the editing especially and how, how the sound design and how it was all put together the latest film a catalonia story is also a, an amazing piece of work so if you guys haven't seen it just follow the links to to the full-length version of it but first let's talk to brennan and see how he actually made it happen hey brennan how are you doing hey tom good good having you here so great to be here you're in hong kong right now right yeah, Hong Kong. Kind of how did the whole thing come about? Like, was it an idea that came to you or was it literally a client that approached you with the, with the idea for this film? Sure, well, this one was for a client. This one was for the Tourism Board of Catalonia, uh, part of the Catalonia Experience promotional campaign. So they came to me and just said, hey, we, we hire a few filmmakers a year to make short films about Catalonia and we let them do whatever they want. And I uh, actually, I wasn't able to get to this project for almost six months after they first approached me because I had a bunch of other stuff on my slate. So I had been thinking about it and gestating the idea and just like imagining what could I do that's a little bit different from what I've done before. And I, I settled on the concept of some sort of a narrative uh, and I wanted to do a narrative about the backpacker experience, about the experience of somebody who's young, who's broke, who just wants to kind of get out there and have fun in Catalonia without a real agenda. So that was the guiding sort of overall principle of the narrative. And then beyond that, I just wanted to have fun with it. I wanted to make sure the story was fun to shoot and hopefully, you know, hopefully just as fun to watch. Um, I didn't want to do anything that was too serious because I see it as like a 10 minute escape. You know, it should be something that you watch and you don't have to really get you don't have to get into any like deep dark emotions because you know it's a promotional film it's basically still a commercial for Catalonia and uh yeah and I wanted to keep that lighthearted spirit so so you saying they approached you like you know six months before uh, you actually you know b began working on this was it before you released Seoul Wave Yes, I believe they approached me before I was finished with Soul Wave. So they hadn't seen that yet then, basically? No, I don't think they'd seen that. Oh, okay, okay. All right, because I was wondering whether that came thing, like, was there, it, maybe, yeah, tell me, was there, like, a, similarities or big differences between those two films? Because then Soul Wave was what? Was a passion project or also for client? Soul Wave was a passion project, yes. Soul okay. Wave was entirely personal. It was just me in Seoul with no agenda whatsoever, walking around and shooting a few hours a day with my camera for a month. So that was Seoul. Catalonia was, was a very concentrated, very focused shoot where we had pretty much a set agenda, a set agenda before we went to Catalonia to shoot at all. And we had 14 days period to shoot that. And we just kind of executed as efficiently as possible to get everything done because we had a lot of locations to cover. We had a lot of story to tell. So it was a very like different shooting process between Seoul. So it was and very Catalonia. organized, I guess you're saying compared to Seoul Wave then. Yeah, <laughs> Catalonia was much more organized. I mean, there was still improvisation because it still didn't have a script exactly. Okay, so that was going to be my next question then. So, so was there an out outline or like a plan or or a script with actual dialogue or nothing at all like that? There was a concept and there were story beats that we had worked out in advance. I guess it's maybe a little bit like how they used to shoot uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, you know, that, that show with Larry David, where they had yeah. general outlines for each scene, but they didn't have dialogue written in advance. And that gave them the freedom to just kind of play around with stuff until something worked. That's, that's basically what we did with this story. And we even invented scenes later on that we wanted to put earlier in the story. And we did little pickup shoots to add those scenes. So there was stuff that was still kind of, you know, created on the fly, on the spur of the moment. There's stuff that I came up with after we had already begun, begun shooting, but the overall itinerary was still kind of set beforehand because we knew we wanted to cover certain major landmarks and those had to be planned. We had to get permission for those in advance. You know, we wanted to shoot Barcelona, we wanted to shoot the Pyrenees, we wanted to go down to Cadiz in Costa Brava, film the beach. We wanted to hang out with some fishermen and have a dinner with fishermen. 
And th those major scenes had to get planned in advance. And then the in-betweeny stuff where they're just kind of running around and, you know, maybe diving into a river or, you know, having an improvisational little chat. Those kinds of scenes we, uh, we sort of invented on the fly as we were shooting. Uh, so you said you had 14 days to shoot like the, the, the principal photography, but then you had some pickup days. Like overall, did, did it, like, was it, did the shoot go more or less how you planned it? The, the pickup days were part of the 14. Oh, okay, okay. All right. So you Basically, shot everything within 14 days then? Yeah, we had 14 days period, and we decided to reallocate some of those days toward the end and, and find little, basically little pockets of time where we could run out and shoot. Like there's, um, there's a scene where the guys go camping in the woods because they get lost. That scene was not originally planned to be in the story at all. Originally, they were supposed to hike all day and then find the cabin at the end of the day, this little cabin in the woods. But I decided as I was editing that their hike needed to seem more challenging and getting lost needed to have more consequences. So I wanted to have a scene where they decide to sleep in the woods and, uh, and we had to slot that in basically at the very, very end of the shoot. And we ended up shooting it before dinner on a break uh, in a little patch of trees that we found next to the side of the road. They weren't in the woods at all. They were just basically in like a little grove that had enough enough like overgrowth so that you couldn't see the road. And I replaced all the audio in post because you could hear the cars in the original audio. So yeah, so my, my next question then would be like about the actors. So the actors, the, the three guys I'm guessing, the main, they're actual professional actors that you hired? Mm -mm. Well, okay, professional actors. I don't want to insult them. They are professional uh, vloggers, I would say. They have a YouTube channel and they vlogged for like two years while they were backpacking together. They're real friends. They're from Birmingham in the UK and they've traveled the world together. They're actual travelers. Um, and they just responded to a casting call that I put on Instagram. I just made some Instagram stories saying, hey, I'm looking for a few real backpackers to be in this video that I'm making. You're gonna be acting, it's gonna be fiction. I'm gonna give you a storyline, but I don't need people who are already professional actors. So if you're, just a regular dude and you're a backpacker, go ahead and apply. That's basically what I said. <laughs> and yeah, these guys, the three of them applied. I was expecting one applicant, you know, I was mostly, most of the other candidates that I were looking at were just like single backpackers. But these three guys applied together and I was like, oh, okay, they have a funny dynamic, a funny chemistry. Uh, so I modified the storyline so that it could fit three people instead of one protagonist. Now, were you worried at all that they didn't know how to act, like that it might seem a little fake or you kind of are used to working with people who are maybe, let, let's say if they didn't have the skill. Yeah, well, I'm used to, I'm used to directing people who are non-actors. I mean, all of my travel videos, you know, feature non-actors who, in a lot of the little scenes that I would shoot for these travel videos, I have them act in some way or another, you know, it, whether it's just ignoring the camera or telling somebody to walk in a certain direction and have a certain, like, way that they walk. I've directed people a lot in that respect, but this was going a lot deeper than that. So I was worried uh, about the performances coming off as too staged or losing sort of the, the dynamic between them that drew me to them in the first place. I was really worried about crushing that by giving them lines and forcing them to be people they weren't in real life. So it was, yeah, it was kind of a tricky thing. I mean, we had done some improv in our Skypes before we actually started filming. We had done some improvisational kind of warm-ups exercises and icebreakers and just general like, you know, like getting to know you kind of uh, things like that to try, to try to get them more comfortable with the concept of acting and being in a fictionalized scenario. But, you know, once we were there in person, we still had to work out exactly how this whole acting thing was gonna work. Like, were they gonna say lines that I gave them or were they just gonna improvise stuff and I was gonna edit it down to something usable later? You know, were they going to, uh, were they gonna feed off each other naturally or was I gonna shoot one angle at a time and then combine the performances in post? So how, how was it then? Like, were they improving a lot and, and did you have to edit a, 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 around it a lot or were they kind of spot on, like kind of how we see in the final film? It was a lot of, I would say, kind of four-way improvisation where each of them improvised in their own way and then I was the fourth uh, improviser. So I would be filming them and talking back to them as they would improvise. So they would, you know, they would come up with a line and I would say, okay, okay, that's a good line. Uh, can you try saying it more like this? And then they would try it my way. And then another one of them, you know, would jump in and say, 
uh, what about if you say that and then I say this? And then that person would add their line to the line. So it was like the four of us were sitting around workshopping a scene, but I was behind the camera recording the whole, like everything basically felt like we were rehearsing. You know, it's like I was recording the rehearsal. And eventually I cut that down to, you know, to feel like a pre-written scene just by taking out all the bad takes and taking out the improvisations that didn't quite work. Oh, that's pretty cool. Because I, I, I was thinking, you know, me, I'm kind of used to working in fiction, so I, I, I have a detailed script and you always stick to that. Uh, and I hate working with like and doing improv, so that's why I wasn't sure because this felt like really well polished. Uh, and it's kind of incredible that you were able to do it with, with, with without actually having a specific script like line by line. So, uh, very, very, very good job. Uh, so, how big was the the crew then? Like, was it? Uh, I'm guessing you operated the camera. Yeah, I was one operator. I had up to three cameras rolling at any given time, depending on the scene, because we had three dudes. So, I wanted to have a camera for each person, so I didn't miss any reactions or any you know little comments they may throw in that. Otherwise, we'd have to get recreated through another take. Uh, we also had uh, a driver, fixer, production coordinator. We had uh, this guy, uh, Menel Cuesta, who's amazing, who drove us around in a big van and contacted his local friends whenever we wanted to access something special that we didn't otherwise know how to access. Uh, so he was a really, really integral, really important part of the production. And uh, I had an overseeing producer, Ansley Sawyer, who basically put the whole production together logistically and made sure that all of the different uh, players, whether it was the camera side of things or other people who were helping us fix, you know, local friends and stuff, making sure all that came together smoothly, making sure everybody communicated smoothly. And she also ran a camera sometimes because she's a director and a shooter. So what's the, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, what's, what's the, like your gear that you used for most of the shooting? I shot it with mostly my normal gear, you know, Sony A7R3. The other cameras were just A7Threes because the other shooters owned those cameras. So those were the, the closest match. And we shot a lot of it handheld. I shot a lot of it with a gimbal. Um, I used mostly, I think, the Moza Air gimbal for this one. So yeah, we mic'd everybody up with just lav mics connected to iPhones. And then we had occasionally a boom mic and we had sometimes uh, other you know, other external recorders lying around to capture dialogue from various places. So there was a lot of redundancy with the audio and we just went with whichever mic sounded the best for the scene. Uh, and in terms of lighting, I think we maybe used an LED once or twice for fill and occasionally a reflector here and there, but for the most part it was just natural light. Uh, and then we had drones, you know, we had a, a Mavic Air, we had a Mavic Pro, and we had a Phantom 4 Pro. We had a drone company that was running our drones for us. They're called Aero Shots, and they're just a, uh, a company that's local to the Catalonia region. All right, so let's uh, let's jump into the, the post-production then. So you, you shot it, you're saying 14 days in September and last year, and then post-production, because the film just came out, so was it, the, you know, did the post-production take that long or you were just, you know, busy with other projects or like how long was the post-production? Yeah, so I actually had a first cut done after maybe just the first week of returning home. But it took a while to get to the final cut stage, partially because the client went on vacation for a while. Uh, the tourism board took a number of vacations uh, over the winter. So it was hard for me to get feedback from them. And then on top of that, I had a lot of trouble uh, with music, actually, finding the right music and making it fit. So I ended up hiring a composer to recreate some temp tracks that I had laid in. Uh, Stephen Richard Davis, who's composed for a number of other films that I've done. He composed for Soul Wave, he composed for my Hong Kong film. Uh, he's done a bunch of different scores for me. So we had to sort of find a way to create music that was uh, a little bit Catalan sounding while also just having the right sort of energy and not stepping on the dialogue too much. That was a tricky thing. And we actually ended up combining some pre-recorded tracks that I'd gotten from bands and from like libraries with his original compositions and kind of crossfading the two so that we could have quieter sections under the dialogue and then have the full mix come in in between dialogue scenes. Now with the like sound was something that really stood out for me in the film. As in, like it was, just, it seemed like it was going in and out at the like key moments, just to give you enough of the atmosphere of the locations. 
So you're saying you shot, like you, you recorded all this wild sound and that's what you guys used or was there a lot of afterwards like recording sound or sound design in post-production? I did my usual sound design. I usually add a bunch of sound effects to my films in post. Basically, if it's a sound that I can possibly enhance in post, I will. And especially the natural sounds that are fairly easy to find, you know, water and wind and trees and things like that, I usually will add layers. And because the production audio is always mono, and I want the final mix to feel big and feel stereo, so uh, you know the the library sound comes in handy for that, for adding the ambience behind the dialogue. I'd say 99% of the dialogue was real, though. 99% of it was what we actually recorded on location, because I didn't want it to sound. I didn't want it to have that ADR sort of overly calculated sound to it <laughs> that you tend to get when you re-record your dialogue in post. So I used mostly the real audio from the real takes, even if it wasn't quite perfect. Okay. Uh, and what about then with the editing? Was it was it uh, straightforward? You know, like when you have a narrative film, you have, you have a script that you stick to and you just edit according to that. But you kind of didn't have a script or not, at least not a detailed one. So how was the editing? Was there a lot of experimentation or, or you kind of knew right away how, how you know, it's going to fall in place? There was a lot of experimentation because I was originally planning on cutting it down to about five to six minutes. That was my goal. And I thought that I would be using much shorter snippets of the dialogue than I ended up using. So I was worried about that originally because I thought it would pull the video out of the flow of the montage too much and make it feel too much like a, a staged narrative, like, you know, episode of a TV show or something, which wasn't really the feel that I wanted. I still wanted it to feel like a travel film. Did you have any, like, like from the clients, any requests or... You know, like like sometimes a client will be very specific, like we need a five minute version or some yeah. things like that, or were you pretty free? <laughs> the client said they need a, a one to three minute version, which I still have to deliver. Yeah, that's not done yet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I okay. still have to cut well, it that's down. That's gonna be painful. Yeah, I, you know, I'm seeing it, I'm trying to see it as an opportunity to make a pure montage version. You know, a version that's more like a regular travel film where it's mostly uh, mostly imagery and transitions and music and sound effects. So we'll see what I can come up with in that regard. You know, they're, they're letting me keep the 10 minute version at least, which is good. You know, I can post that on all my channels. They're just gonna post the short version. I mean, I, I'm glad you didn't cut it down more because I felt like, I, I think it was just enough amount of story, like you said, like there's that dialogue, there's this, like, you, uh, the, uh, you know, one of, I guess the reasons why it caught my eye is because like I said, it was the first travel video or, or film that is, uh, that actually like were actually you know cared about what the characters are doing like there, are, you know there was and there was a little surprise where they take the train and then it turns out they're they're going in the wrong, the wrong direction and then they get last further and all that stuff so though that's what kept me going like when I was watching it because again there's a lot of videos with pretty images but not enough videos I feel like online that people produce where where you actually care about finding out what what happens at the end so I just want to say this was an experiment. I didn't know how it would turn out. I didn't know how people would react. I didn't know if people would watch it and say, you know, this is crap. You should just go back to transitions and swoopy camera shots with gimbals and you know, like leave the character stuff out. We don't want to see that. We just want to see, we just want to see temples and and you know, orbiting gimbal shots. I didn't know if people would connect with the guys as characters. I didn't know if people would like the music. You know, the music is very different from what I usually use. Um, so I'm just happy that that you liked it at least and it seems like a lot of the people in the comments have liked it and I want to move forward with more narrative stuff and keep going in this direction and see what what new territories I can explore. So since this was you know a, a paid job that you did you kind of had a, a goal you had to reach but let's say if there's a, somebody out there traveling you know through a, a, another part of the world or maybe the same part of, you know in there in Spain and it, somebody who basically just wants to make a film somebody you know gets inspired by your work do you think that it's it, pretty much anybody with the right obviously skills and talent would, would would be able to produce the kind of work, this kind of film that you did, even if they don't have an official budget uh, and they're kind of just improvising it, sort of like you did with your Soul Wave film? I think, I think in terms of equipment, yes. The equipment that I used was, was good, you know, for the cause, but nothing unique. It's not like I needed highly specialized cameras or mics or anything to shoot this. But the I mean, you, you, you use pretty much the gear that you always use for all your films and videos, right? I used what was in my backpack, yeah.
Oh, okay. I didn't go out of my way to to buy anything special for this. I didn't get any special lenses or you know a, any special audio equipment or anything. It was all just stuff I already owned. Uh, but what does get expensive is the arrangement of everything because unlike a travel film, when you have a script, when you have some sort of a narrative that you must tell, then you have to make sure things happen the way they should happen. With a travel video, like with a montage, you know, if I go somewhere and that scene just doesn't work out, then I can just make a montage without that scene. But for a narrative, those scenes have to happen. And part of how to make it happen is to either pay people or pay locations or pay a driver or get lodging in advance or secure tickets in advance. And these things cost money. And that's where most of the budget of this film went was in arranging the events so that when we showed up the right stuff was happening and we had the right access and the actors had a place to sleep and we had a place to eat yeah so that's that's the concerns that i think uh filmmakers who want to do this with zero budget that's what they should really pay attention to more than the cameras and you know the audio equipment and the lights and stuff all right um so any any kind of last bits of maybe words of advice or yeah just kind of words of advice for other aspiring filmmakers or people who want to do these kind of, you know, uh, beautiful pieces of work like you do with travel videos and travel films. Uh, yeah. Anything you want to share? You know, try to try putting some human interest in there beyond just the, the sights and the sounds and the transitions and the color grading and teal and orange and, you know, Final Cut Pro preset warp zooms. Try doing something else. See how it turns out. Uh -huh. I think my favorite travel films are the ones where people have reached beyond the obvious and reached beyond what's trendy right now and just done what they felt would best represent the heart of the place that they're in as opposed to what they feel is going to be the most like clickbaity what's going to what's going to grab the audience the most visually you know because the razzle dazzle like everybody's doing it everybody's doing the fast cut transitions and all the tricks and all the all the special effects but what not a lot of people are doing is creating something that has genuine soul to it or any depth. And I don't know if this film is 100% successful in that regard. I'm not going to say it's perfect by any means. You know, it was definitely an experiment for me, definitely something new. But um, I, think, I think it was good at least to try and get there and create something that the audience could care about, you know, if the film works as I intended. All right. All right. Thank you, then. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you did... And you want to hear more from Brandon, then uh, I'm going to provide the links. You guys can check out, uh, of course, the full version of, the, of the, his film. And also go check out his uh, YouTube channel. Anyways, thank you guys. I'll see you in the next video.